morning. morning. Good, good morning. morning. Good morning. good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. I'm so glad you're here today. We are continuing our study of wonder. I'll go ahead now and spotlight me. Sorry about that, but I want us to also just be able to get started. It's already 930 this morning, so what a joy to be with you this morning. On Thursdays, I always love the morning, and I hope you all do too. It's just a pleasure and a delight and an honor to spend time with you today. So uh, before we begin, how about I open us in, in a word of prayer. If you want to go ahead and mute yourself, that'd be great. If not, we'll go do that as we move along. But would you join me in, in prayer? Lord, we thank you so much for this day. For this opportunity to once again experience community. We are together even in this space of one screen to another, but Lord, it draws us together and we invite you to join us as well in this space. God, we know that you are at work in the daily rhythms, in, in the seasonal rhythms, in the beautiful book of nature you've given to us in our hearts and in our minds. And so we ask Lord that you would show us with wonder a little bit more of who you are and how we can walk with you in, in this daily life. And so let's join together as a, a community of women just seeking more of that this morning. And we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So once again, I hope you all enjoyed meeting our author last weekend, and it was fun to get some stories, a follow-up regarding that. That was an awesome connection that we had. You can still connect with Barbara Mahaney, the author of our book, Stillness of Winter. You can do that um, on her website. You can visit her website. There's a, a link that you can connect with her personally. And she was generous enough to share her email that went out in our class email, uh, for last week. So that was a joy and a delight. And we continue to just rest in the beauty of her writing, the words, the encouragement she's providing for us and the lessons that we can draw from that. And so that's what we aim to do today as we begin February. What? February. I have a slide for this just to start us for today. See if we can pull up that slide. Yes, yes. February. It's the month where we're wise to put our ear to the heartbeat all around. They're stirring deep beneath the crust of earth and deep within our weary selves. Invisible, but certain. Yeah. I just love Meaning, that. Meaning, ID, and all yeah. that. I mean. Yeah. All right, I'm, I'm sorry, Pat, you're still having a hard time with sound, I know. I hope it works out. Well, that's just a kind of an intro to February. I'm also just gonna share a little bit more from the book, the beginning of our reading. It's titled February Stirring Within, page 165 and 166. I love how February is described as this. February tries its darndest to turn us into doubters. Who says the days upon days of dreary will draw to an end? What if we're stuck in the midst of eternal winter? Okay, all our Kansas folks, look out your window right now. Am I right? <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> what if we never unclench from our own tight coils? Wow. She goes on to say, O oh, ye of wobbling certitude, dial up your faith and your fine tuned antennae. February is laden with clues. Love that. And so we're going to ponder that just a little bit today. And just as we've done before, I'm actually going to ask you just to think this through. Remember, we've used some blank pieces of paper and a magic marker. And so now's the time. Grab your piece of paper, grab a marker. And I want you to think a little bit, even in the midst of perhaps doubting, even in the midst of these snow flurries that are happening here. But remember yesterday in Kansas, we had bright sunshine, didn't we? And soon to come, we'll see these little clues that 
are described. February is laden with clues. Clues for what? For springtime, right? For newness, for hope, for joy, for our faith to be renewed. And so I want you to write in one word, if you can, on your piece of paper, what is one sign of spring that you can think of and you can't wait to see? What is the first sign of spring you usually notice? What's one word that speaks faith instead of doubt? What's one word that can encourage all of us to enjoy? And I see now this chat message, hi Leanne from Fort Worth, Texas. Ah, oh, 72 degrees there yesterday. <laughs> So maybe it's sunshine, maybe it's a, a flower, a bloom, maybe it's what, what's the one word that speaks hope, speaks spring, that will make us all maybe smile just a little bit. What's that one word for you? I'll give you 10 more seconds to write it down. And then like we've done before, we're gonna hold it up, see if we can grab a couple of screenshots. Remember last week our author joined us and she held up a little post-it note and we couldn't even read it. <laughs> so hopefully you all have a bigger piece of paper. All right, are we ready? And yeah, if you don't have paper, you can put it in the chat. So I'm gonna take myself off spotlight. I encourage you to look at gallery view, hold up your piece of paper. I've got a hyacinth here. That's my first sign I usually see. Forsythia flowers, daffodils, Linton roses, buds on trees, crocus flowers, singing birds, yes. Robins and tulips, buds. All right, let's see. Linda, uh, cardinal, yes, the red cardinal. I love that. Grass greening, yes. I'm switching through here. Vaccines. Amen. Longer days. Promise. Melting. Yes. Did I get everybody color? Uh, let's see. D, I'm looking at yours real closely. Let me see if I can see it. Surprises. Yes. Surprises. That speaks spring and hope, doesn't it? All right. Did I miss anybody? The robins. Yes. The blooming. Absolutely. And in our chat, the narcissist, uh, is it the nar uh, narcissist? <laughs> is that a flower, a name of a flower? Laura, you might have to teach me on that. The subtle greening of our yards. Yes, Carol, I think I got you the Linton roses. Uh, narcissus. Narcissus, there we go. It's a flower, isn't it? Now you know I'm not a green thumb, people. Now you know. All right. I hope that those little words and, and uh, signs of spring just encourage us all as we continue to take a look at our February. Okay, let me get myself set up here. All right, thank you for participating. I love it that we can share a little bit in that way just with our words that we write and show up on the screen. Okay, so. A little bit more um, from our book on 166, our author talks about the first stirrings of winter loosening its grip and you all named some of those things. She talks about the morning song of the cardinal, the tips of the branches, the buds, the leaves clasped in prayer. I love that. She talks about the festival of new trees and it's said to be, for our Jewish friends, this is the day when God decides how bountiful the fruit of each tree will be in the coming year. I love that. I love that. I've got one more slide I want to share with you that our book encourages us. I love this statement. It's on uh, in our book in this section here that we are to bow down to the breathtaking, invisible knowing that the rhythms of heaven and earth unfold according to divine ordination and the shifting of season, our own and that of the cosmos is blessing beyond blessing. What a good thing that we're paying attention. Each of you who had a word to share or you know, have, have a thought on that, you're paying attention. And I think that's one of the great lessons from this book that we're going through, this idea to truly pay attention. Okay, 
One other fun thing in our book, of course, is the recipe box. And there's a whole new set of recipes for February. And I got one of you to send me a picture. I know some of you did, tried some recipes along the way, but let's take a look at this. Mm, this <laughs> looks delicious. Can you smell it? The chicken rice Grammy Carla made. Look at it. Rice and mushrooms and broth and chicken. Yum. I just, I don't know what else to say, but yum. <laughs> Thank you, Carla. And I want to encourage you all to give some of those a try. If nothing, read the way that Barbara, the author, describes how to, how to assemble these recipes. Her descriptions are just so fun. Okay, February. It's the shortest month with the longest view, isn't it? <laughs> The title of the very next section, Why I Won't Give Up on February. I needed to hear this. She says that February pushes you pretty much to the precipice. You got the urge to pack it up and just move into a secret closet, turn out the lights and just stew a while. Perhaps like Mr. Groundhog, you'll peek out from time to time catch the gloomy sky, dart back to where the coats dangle and the boots convene and a convention of vacuum busting dust balls exist. <laughs> or on page 169, or she says, perhaps you'll rebel a little bit. You'll go on cold strike. You'll saunter out to get the mail and just some skimpy little t-shirt and shorts. Forgo the knee high rubber wellies. Do strappy sandals instead. Show skin and what you're made of. Give those neighbors a big shock as hearts can handle in the month of gooey chocolate stuffed in frilly foil heart-shaped boxes. Okay, I want to know if anybody is going to be brave enough to go out to the mailbox in your shorts. <laughs> That would be a testament to your faith, right? She says, you can grouse from now till thaw about the unrelenting march of spirit beating weather. Well, today dialed up for just this part. Remember that we have a chat feature and you can type something in. I say we just lament a little bit. Let's just lament a little bit. Give me a give me a complaint. Go ahead and put it in the chat. Let's grouse. Let's get it off our shoulder. Remember, sometimes it's a freeing when you say something out loud and give it to somebody else. Let's just throw into the chat all of our grousings and complainings and the the coat closet disaster and the dust balls that are around and the dreary, you know, for me, the gray skies are what do it for me. So that's what I'm putting into the chat. Anybody else have something that just does it for you for February that makes you think, oh, is this ever going to end? Sick of the dogs coming in with muddy paws. Yes, I have a UD. Ruth says, good for you. Sorry, I'm enjoying winter, Rose says, and this book. Oh, Rose, you have such wisdom. Thank you. The super cold temperatures, the icy roads that, yeah, we may have today. I love the sign color because, oh, when we held up our signs, because colorless is so bleak. Yeah. Rose, you're from Chicago. Then you're braving it very well, nicely done. Oh, sorry, Ruth. <laughs> I was thinking it was like an automatic vacuum. Okay, she got a UTI and that ain't no fun. All right, Ruth, we all lament with you over that. Patricia says, after we shovel the driveway, the snowplow pushes a huge ridge right across the front. Yes, amen. The unexpected upcoming surgery, Patty, that you're facing right now, I'm sorry cold winds ever blowing. Well, I promise you we'll turn the corner on this, but I think it's okay sometimes to just say, Ugh. you know, Carla says, I had to make a choice this morning to be happy. Kathy, I love this. I love winter. My closet is bulging fleece. <laughs> well, it's okay to complain. It's also okay to celebrate, of course. Yesterday here, we had a high of 58. Next week on Tuesday, did you see, we're gonna have an overnight low of minus five. Hmm. But, but 
just like Rose and just like Kathy and those of you that are embracing this in our book on page 170, our author dares us. She says, I dare you, I do, to catch the flight of furry feathered cardinal in the thick of falling snow and then not whisper, oh dear, the flight from heaven sent to stir my soul. That bird to me is hope on a wing, a laugh out loud reminder that we are not alone. I think I have a slide to show you just what that might look like. Isn't that beautiful? The cardinal and the cardinal mate. <laughs> they can give us that sign that all will be well. All will be well indeed. Spring will come and we are not alone. So, I thought again, we would take a look at some scripture. And so today we're going to take a look at the book of Acts. The book of Acts is in our New Testament. It follows the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the book of Acts. And we've spent just a tiny bit of time in the book of Mark, you remember. But I love this idea of kind of considering where we're at and why a book is written and who the audience uh, it's intended for. And the Gospels, remember that, that Mark at the end, remember he's in such a hurry that he wraps things up with the empty tomb, remember? And he leaves the women in fear. Matthew then, Matthew adds a few lines about Jesus appearing to the disciples in Galilee, commissioning them to carry on. Luke, we're going to come back to Luke a time or two, but Luke tells the story at the end of, of the Luke's gospel, he tells a story of the road to Emmaus, the stranger who meets up with the two disciples and who eventually reveals himself to be Jesus upon breaking bread with them. John's gospel, of course, John, he lingers on what it's like to be a disciple following Easter. And then we come to the book of Acts. So the book of Acts, just to give you kind of a background of it, in two senses, it's, it's the second chapter of a continued story authored by Luke. So, so first of all, it's, it's the second volume in which, in which Luke had sent to Theophilus, which is a man of wealth, perhaps his patron, perhaps his friend. The beginning of Luke, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to share the very beginning. Luke says, I've decided to write a carefully ordered account for you, most honorable Theophilus. So it's the first volume, isn't it? And in the gospel of Luke, he tells the, the story of the life of Jesus upon earth. And then he continues the story in our book of Acts that we'll look at today. He tells the story of the Christian church. This is the second volume of, of his storytelling. Gives words to, to the mystery, to the daringness, to like our book talks about even the audacity of the survival of faith, the survival of the early church. It's the second volume to a story which has no end. And you know what? Today includes each one of us, doesn't it? Kind of like thinking that I'm connected to these stories in scripture. And so before we jump into Acts, I thought we just might set ourselves. And I'm going to read from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 6. Turn there if you like. If not, just stay put in Acts. That's fine. So Luke 24, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. You know... I find it easy to grouse and complain here on February 4th, but I have a choice, don't I? Why am I here looking among the dead? He is risen, right? And I can choose to go there. I love the way that seems to correlate with what we're reading. 
It's like the holy hallelujah of the red cardinal, isn't it? It's the choice we have this month to stand still in our lament or to step outside and like so many of you already embrace what is around us, drink in what this short month has to offer, I think our book says. And that takes us to Acts. So Acts 1, the very beginning, first few verses, one through eight, thought I would share with you. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Whew, I'm telling you, that says a lot in that short passage Jesus not only leaves his, his immortal name and influence, he's, he's telling them here, I'm, I'm still active. I'm still alive. He's not the one. He's the one who is, but he's giving them a, a commission. He's inviting them to join him in his purpose. I asked my good friend on staff, Daryl Holtz, who writes the GPS. Many of you are probably familiar with him, and he's so wise. But I asked him, how dare the early church, how dare it survive? I mean, when you think about it. And, and he reminded me that at this time, there's about 120 people on planet Earth who thought themselves as followers of Jesus. And Jesus tells them, go and spread the good news in Jerusalem, like in your hometown where, where you live, beyond that in Judea, in the area, beyond that in, into Samaria, and beyond that to the end of the earth. In Acts 1.8, when he, he says that to the end of the earth, surely them, some of them had to have thought, us? It's such a preposterous or presumptuous assignment. So how did that message, that movement even survive? Or how do we make it through this short month with a long view? How do we get past this time that we're still in regarding pandemic and, and the weight on vaccines? How do we do this? Well, some of what happened in scripture still happens today. A part of that answer is the power of the Holy Spirit, right? In a special way, God poured out the Holy Spirit to empower the early Christians, to protect the growth of the church, to see it moving forward. The Holy Spirit plays such a specific role in each one of our own lives. And we can invite that power and that presence, that guidance, that uh, the words to say, the, the change of attitude, we can choose to invite the Holy Spirit and then do all we can to follow. Secondly, the impact of Jesus's resurrection. Just like we've heard and talked about before, we can stand in fear. This, the passage from Luke, we can stand looking among the dead or we can believe Jesus rose and is alive and then invites us to be part of his continued living purpose. The apostles believed, so did the, the women. Remember, they believed Jesus was the promised Messiah before he went to the cross. And then the tragedy of that shattered hope. But Acts tells of the effect of seeing Jesus as the risen Lord. 
receiving forgiveness, becoming bold and confident. If you read through some more chapters in Acts, you'll see what happens to his uh, apostles and how they rose up in boldness. And then here's the, the more direct tie-in, I believe, with our book. In, in this passage that we read, it says to wait, to wait and receive power from the Spirit. We right now are waiting. We are still in this time. You know, I don't know about you all. Uh, some of us are probably looking forward to a little game going on this Sunday, right? A little game happening coming up soon. I looked at my pictures from last year. We got together with people. We are small group. We watched the game together. We're all at the very end, just grinning and smiling with our number ones up in the air. This time it's gonna be grand, no doubt, but we're gonna watch it here at home. And we're not gonna have a gathering, a get together. We're in the wait still. We're, we are asked to be still. And yet this teaches that the word wait, it means to hope or to put trust in or to look expectantly to those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength from Isaiah. And so that can be something that we might be embracing, celebrating and finding some joy in. It's also teaching me lessons for one. It's teaching me some things that I should no longer take for granted, right? Take we, we are learning what I will no longer take for granted again. And so like we've done before, I wanna invite our awesome, amazing, wonderful, lovely breakout leaders to help me in this, to share what they are learning about not taking for granted. And Cheryl, I think we'll start with you if that would be all right. So I'm gonna get Cheryl here ready to go and pull her up on the screen and and let's learn from these amazing women what they are no longer taking for granted. Cheryl, you're muted. You got to unmute. Okay. Are you ready for me? Yes. I am reminded that life is fragile. My story revolves around one dear couple in my neighborhood that befriended me after I moved in. Three different events at three different times, challenging me three different ways, but three different outcomes. I can take no credit for my words or actions in these three events, because as I look back, God had a plan for me, if only I recognized how precious life is. She came over one afternoon a bit agitated, saying she needed girl time. I asked her, now would work? Yes, she answered. I asked if she'd like a glass of wine, and she replied, yes, I really need that too. We talked for hours and hours, a lovely lady. We discovered she was a TWA hostess when my dad was a TWA pilot. And her best friend of 45 years was in my Sunday school class and they also were members of CORE. The next time, after gardening all day, I was hungry, tired, achy and dirty, but accepted an invite to come join her on her front porch with her husband. He knew I was an artist and an art teacher. So he brought out two works of art. One was a blue ribbon drawing by his daughter while in high school, and it was exceptional. The second was a large drawing of a yellow elephant he had done as a child. It was so cute. We laughed and laughed and had so much fun that day. Only a week later, the ambulance, the paramedics, the fire truck, and the police all arrived at their house on a Sunday morning. The police were reverently guarding the premises and no family members were there. Suddenly, I somehow knew, I just knew I was supposed to call her best friend. I did. And 20 minutes later, she arrived to support and comfort her best friend of 45 years who had just lost her husband that morning and still no family members had yet to arrive. Mm, Cheryl, thank you. Beautiful, thank you. Pam, I'm gonna call you up, Pam. Mm. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, well, that's a tough one to follow. That was beautiful. <laughs> I know. Uh, well, oh since goodness. I'm a cupcakes and rainbows gal, it, gal, it's hard for me to say that I take anything for granted. So I, I, I probably won't be able to say that. But I've got some things that I wrote down, just that are some thoughts. Um, 
As I mentioned to our author last week, this book, it is stunning to me how parallel this is with the times that we are living in. Who would have known that this is, I, I told her this is a, a, a workbook for COVID uh, to, to work our way through. I could say that I'll never take for granted a restaurant experience. And yet living on my, uh, on my own for the last five years, I eat alone most times. And it never, ever bothers me when I'm home. But when I am out with people, I enjoy it so much more than I ever used to. So I think my time of taking things for granted was, was then. So it's still parallel to, to now what will be after, after COVID. And I wrote something down that you had mentioned when you said the audacity of survival yeah. from the Bible. And that audacity to do this pandemic in a way that I thrive, not simply survive, is mm. so important to me. Again, that's parallel to my experience five years ago. So it's kind of like it's all not all mushed together, but it's all just marching together. So mm. just a few, just a few thoughts. Love it. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Barb, gonna have you share. Good morning, everybody. Um, as I thought about this, I thought of conversations with a friend over coffee, over a lunch, and realizing that maybe there's many friends that I haven't seen or had that, I mean, I haven't had that opportunity to do that for the last year. You never know when it's gonna be the last time you have a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm not gonna take that for granted anymore. Um, celebrations with friends. Um, I was thinking uh, this week, we too were with a group of uh, uh, friends and a big Super Bowl party and it was wonderful. And we will be, you know, my husband and I will be here watching the game um, by ourselves. And so that celebration with friends, with um, weddings, funerals, births and birthdays, I'll never, I won't take those for granted anymore. Um, and then um, our health our health, our immune system, as we uh, protect ourselves and those that we love and we live this life and do life. Um, we, I just, I won't take that for granted anymore either. So mm -hmm. that's it. Absolutely. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Barb. Hello everyone. Well, um, I no longer want to take for granted my husband. I think I brought this up before. Stephen is a very spontaneous person compared to my very, I'm very structured. I, I'm, I'm, I like to be organized. I like to know what time I'm going to do everything in my day, even during this time. And so when uh, my husband is essential a uh, staff. So when he's off on the weekdays or the weekend, um, <laughs> in the beginning, it would be very uh, disconcerting to me that he would just pop in to my scheduled day and with whatever he wanted to say. And, um, but uh, we've even created a system where I will light a candle. He sees the candle. He knows that means I'm doing something and it's my own time. <laughs> but, but what he does now is he says, I see the candle. I just want to tell you something just really quick. <laughs> and he does that. And then he goes away. And what I've learned to realize is that what began as kind of a little bit of an irritation when he would interrupt me is now this joyful giggle time that I so appreciate because it's so funny that he sweetly says, oh, I see your candle. But I <laughs> I just have to tell you this one thing. And so I will not take my husband's spontaneous nature. Good neighboring, I will not take for granted uh, during this pandemic. Uh, I think good neighboring has risen to new heights for me. Um, I'm no longer taking uh, the wave that I have when I, oh, I uh, a pass by someone from across the street because they're trying to do the right thing with social distancing and 
in my neighborhood because it is a, a closed community, uh, a private uh, lake community. We don't have a lot of people, so we don't wear masks when we take our walks, uh, but we do respect one another and we'll cross so that we're not passing each other close by. Uh, and I will not take for granted that there's so much more in those waves and in those smiles and in those hellos than um, one might think because we can't stand and talk and chat uh, for long periods of time close to one another like we used to. And my last thing I'm going to say is soul food. <laughs> I'm not gonna take it for granted. Um, soul food is not uh, part of my normal uh, menu because I've always been uh, what I would call a nutritious cook. Um, but I will never, never take fried chicken for granted <laughs> because I'm telling you fried chicken and mashed potatoes makes my husband and I so happy. And we just take pictures of it. We send it to our children. I mean, this is really weird. I make it and then I, I, I take pictures of it and send it to my kids. That's how happy it makes me. So I will never, never take homemade fried chicken for granted again. And those mm -hmm. are my three. <laughs> Perfect. That is perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Patty. Um, hi, everyone. I don't think mine are very profound, um, but I, uh, I think they are definitely important. Uh, my first one was my American citizenship. Um, through nothing I have done other than being born in this country, uh, I can't take any responsibility for being an American citizenship, American citizen, but I do definitely think more often how uh, grateful I am for that honor of being an American. Uh, my second one is my, I take, for, I will no longer take for granted that, that I have really good medical insurance and um, excellent medical care. And, I think, you know, I'm, start, I'm gonna have my fourth sur surgery in the last 18 months next week. And I never have to worry about um, how am I gonna pay it and uh, who's gonna do it? And, you know, is there gonna be people to help me? So I am so grateful for um, my, the gift of medical insurance and good medical care. And my last one is um, I'm very grateful for my DNA, my family of origin uh that taught me about faith and family and i think um uh, i was thinking i was thinking about this last night i my husband and i like to watch the show finding your roots and last night we were watching an episode that had to do with two people who had um, irish roots which um i do too and and some of the things that they had gone their their ancestors had gone through to to get here and stuff. And they were talking about how uh, they appreciate that, that DNA that's passed on from generations to generations. And a lot of it has to do with faith and family and resilience and um, humor. I mean, my parents were very humorous people without being hilarious, but I mean, and I see that, I see that in my children, and now I see it in my grandchildren. So I will not take my family of origin for granted. Thank you. Absolutely. Oh, thank you, Patty. Thank you all. You all are very profound. I shared with these discussion leaders, I wish I could go back and get every single single thing that they said and type it up into, it would be a great devotional book, wouldn't it? Or just a so thank you, thank you for sharing. So we'll move into a time of discussion and we're gonna consider three different questions and I have them worked up on slides, but your discussion leaders have these as well. So the first three questions and here's the first one. The book calls the shifting of the season a blessing. So talk about what's your favorite season, fall, winter, spring or summer and what is it about your favorite that makes it so? All right, that's the first one, next. This, the shortest month of the year, might just offer a long view of ourselves. And so coupled with the advice to stay home, like we've been talking about, we still need to stay home, we do have an opportunity to learn a lot about ourselves. So what lessons are you learning? What do you know now that you didn't before? And then thirdly, 
we're going to ask you to do the very same things that the discussion leaders just did to talk about the things that you will never take for granted again. The book says that extremes of life remind us that life is fragile. We're wise to not take so many things for granted. So those are your three topics. We're going to have, let's see, 20 minutes of discussion, and then we'll come back together. I want to share a little bit more, and we are going to be brave and open up the book of Revelation today. And so there's a little segment in there I'd like to share with you from scripture. And then we'll have uh, our final discussion questions to end. So I'm gonna open the rooms, have great discussion. Welcome back again. I want to share just a little bit more with you all before we take a look at the the um, our next go round of discussion questions. So, in our book, I loved the titles again of these sections. And so, this last one we're going to talk about is titled "Survival Astonishingly." Already kind of pointed to that with the passage from Acts. And we'll point a little bit more to some scripture passages, but from page 176, which is just a few pages into that section, I love what she says here, the top of page 176, she says, we could not for the life of us figure out how those tiny footed creatures, the ones who weigh all of five aspirins or one and a half slices of bread, how in the world would those tiny wisps of heartbeat survive through the long, dark Arctic night? If you had a chance to read that, it was this great story about hearing this loud sound. And by the way, we have a real loud sound here in our neighborhood just the other night. And I don't even think anybody really knows what that was all about. But the book talks about the frost quakes, this seismic event caused by sudden cracking in frozen soil Egad, she says, I think. And then she and her husband worried and worried and worried about survival, about people, certainly, and, and prayed for, you know, homeless and all just everything. And then also the, the poor birds outside. And so she comes to this point where how in the world did they survive? And that's what brought us really to this idea of what the extremes teach us. And I think we have a slide with a pretty lengthy quote from the book that tells us a little bit about, you know, when it takes the extreme, that's what snaps us out of our lethargies, our take it for grantedness. It pulls back the veil to see in sharp focus just how fragile, how precarious all of this is. Sometimes the cold slap is just what we need to rise to deepest attention. I love that, to rise to deepest attention. In, in her story of those birds, it was a death-defying feat, wasn't it? The red cardinal survived this awful polar vortex night. Let's turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter five. Revelation, as you know, at the end of your Bible, chapter five, we'll just read the first few verses. Revelation chapter five says this. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. 
I'm going to jump over to verse 13 and 14. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forevermore. The four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Woo. I don't know about you, but that talks about the extreme, doesn't it? That gives us this picture in revelation language, which, you know, kind of talks about these grand dramatic scenes and visions, but it really just elaborates for us, articulates this idea of the extreme. I've mentioned this author before, Barbara Brown Taylor, and she's written a book called Always Home. And in, in her book, she talks about this passage and she gets kind of really detailed when it talks about no one from on heaven or earth or under the earth could even look, right? And so here's what she has to say. I just think this makes such good sense to us. And it speaks to, in Barbara's language, to the nature around us, how we are all, all connected. So here's what Barbara Brown Taylor says. She says, to get the sound right. So imagine, remember, it said, uh, all began to praise and sing, right? All of them, this great tribulation. So to get that sound just right, the image of this, the, the experience of this, she says, you have to hold the soprano bird voices in your head and then add the bass voices of lions and whales and hippopotami to the mix. Then layer in the baritone cows, the raccoon, the crocodile tenors. Are those coyotes or alley cats singing counter tenor? You decide, but don't forget to bring in the altos, the gray dolphins, the red foxes, the yellow Labrador. I don't have a clue what kind of sounds moles or earthworms make, but according to Revelation, they're in the choir too. Remember it said every creature on heaven and earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them. This raises an important question. Barbara Brown Taylor goes on to say, is a weeping willow a creature? How about a mountain or a river? I guess it depends on your definition. If a creature is anything made by God, the sky's the limit. Stars, oceans, willows, lava rocks, they're all in the choir. They all get to sing the same way the hills sing in the Psalms while the trees of the field clap their hands. However mute such creatures may seem to us, the Bible says they are all capable of singing. They're just waiting to find their voices. They are just waiting for the good news that the one seated on the throne has come to free the songs that have been in them all along. I love that. I just love that. Waiting to find the voices. Lane, you added to our, our um, chat. I think we're all, as we wait, we are finding maybe a new octave, a new level, a new, a new sound in our own voice. Again, that's from Barbara Brown Taylor, Always at Home. It's a collection of her sermons that when she goes to visit churches, she gives a sermon and I love it. She's like, always at home. Great, great book. Brings out such wonderful tenets. And with our, our idea of you know having this the uh, time of extreme teach us i love it that revelation gives us a, a movie script kind of vision of that the extremes it starts with no one is worthy not even one to everyone sings in heaven and earth and under the earth and the seas and all that is within them, the willow trees, the snowflakes coming, the sun rays, the stars, the bird song, you and me, we get to add to the choir. I like that. 
when we consider this idea of extremes being slapped out of our lethargy, I think the slide said. And so I hope that's an encouragement to you. I certainly found that it was for me. All right, I want to give you some time to finish up and we have three more discussion questions. Leanne, you put in the chat, yeah, uh, last night, I don't know if any of you participated, but this is Black History Month. And on Wednesday night, last night, and then for one more week next week is just an incredible collection of voices. Yeah, and Patricia Sanders Hall, one of our breakout leaders, you were part of that. So if, if I'll put that in our class email, a link for you if you want to find out a little bit more about that. I love Leanne that you mentioned that. All right, we have three slides with our final three discussion questions. We're gonna have you go back to your rooms. And it, it, our book actually lifts this up, which I didn't know this, Candle Moss. Did you know this? It's a Christian holiday, primarily focuses on Jesus's early life and celebrated on February 2nd, the same day as Groundhog Day, which we just had. In both events, light is significant. So I want you to talk about how does light help to guide you? What does light do for you? Does it expose some things maybe? Does it guide or show the way? I just think that might be a good conversation to have. Okay, and then the next one, it refers us back to our passage from the book of Acts. And so, which, you know, tells the ongoing story of the early church. The question for you to discuss is how do you describe the life of our church today, no matter what church that might be? What excites you about being part of a church as flawed and wonderful as it might be? Share some stories there. And then finally, we have this question uh, that points to our passage we just read in Revelation. Revelation, like I've said, it's like this dramatic, visual, storytelling, movie-like script. Some of it is overwhelming to me, but it sure gets the point across. And it's, it, it's a book that carries the story of salvation through the worst of the worst and then into a glorious celebration. And our passage, verse 13 and 14, especially pointed to that. So what are the words or images you use to describe heaven? Because that's where Revelation kind of takes you. And then are there movies that come to mind in which heaven is revealed? I just think that's kind of a fun prompting to talk about. So does that all sound okay? I wanna see you all. Does that look all right? Thumbs up. If you have conversation around that, I'm gonna open up the breakout rooms again, the same ones, I hope. Yes, I kept them. And then I'll let you end in your breakout time and be dismissed from there if that sounds okay. All right, thumbs up again, yes? All right, here we go. Enjoy your conversations.